Mysterious growing blades, the most powerful homeless man I've ever met, and the hammer battle that would make even MC Hammer blush. The Rings of Power Episode 2 is here, and along with it, a lot more lore, background, and theories to discuss. If you haven't checked out my Episode 1 video, definitely do that, then come on back, grab a pipe, because we have a lot to talk about. The episode begins where we last left Galadriel alone in the Great Sea, after abandoning her trip to Valinor faster than my trip to Mexico when Co COVID started. It's interesting that she looks upward toward the light of the constellation, seeing that a big theme of last episode was how do you know which way is toward the light, up or down? You'll notice there are a few bright stars here pointing out a constellation. Is she using this for navigation, or is this somehow linked to those strange symbols we'll later see the stranger carving into rock? Speaking of the stranger, Nori has stumbled upon his location after he fell from the sky. While her friend Poppy isn't too keen on the idea of helping him, Nori sees no other choice, accidentally falling through the smoldering ground around him, but finding out it's not hot at all. Our first clue that this stranger could be Sauron is the lack of heat from the flames. If you recall in episode 1 when Galadriel was in Forodwaith, she remarked that the place was so evil their torches gave off no warmth. I wonder if something similar is happening here. Clue 2 are these levitating rocks when he rouses to consciousness. Galadriel did refer to Sauron as a sorcerer. Clue 3 is this blast of wind, similar to what happened to Theo when he touched the broken sword which had the mark of Sauron on it. Nori and Poppy both remark this person certainly cannot be a man, for he would have been squished upon landing, nor does he look like an elf. In my episode 1 video, I theorized that this could be Gandalf, and that the writers are trying to make us think that it's Sauron. But at this moment, there's only really one clue that could point to it being Gandalf, and that's his ability to talk to other creatures. He'll talk to these fireflies, and it reminded me of Gandalf whispering to a moth, which led him to being saved by an eagle from his imprisonment at Isengard. Another point against it being Sauron is that he seems to have no recollection of who he is, plus the orcs have already started their encroachment into the lands of men, which I would imagine requires a leader like Sauron behind it. So Nori and Poppy decide to help this stranger, with Nori believing deep down that there must be a reason she's supposed to find him. She also knows caring for him would be frowned upon by the Harfoot people, who prefer to keep to themselves and who who are incredibly superstitious. If anything out of the ordinary happens, that's usually who or what they'll blame if something bad happens, and I guarantee something bad will happen. I wonder if those wolves will come back. They teased them in episode 1, but we haven't seen them since. Wolves have also been known to be attracted to Sauron, so if they do come for the stranger in the next episode or so, I will be talking about that. Across the continent, we find Bronwyn's ancestral home of Horden completely destroyed. But the strange thing is, there's no bodies. The town has been torn asunder by large fissures in the ground. Erandir goes to investigate, but before he does, he almost kisses Bronwyn. It's a forbidden forbidden kind of love. In Eregion, the home of the Noldor Elves, we find the home of Celebrimbor, the master craftsman who King Gilgalad has sent on a special mission, tasking Elrond to help him devise something of real power. This is likely a nod to the Rings of Power of which the series is titled. In order to do this, they'll need to build a tower, one which can host a forge stronger than any other ever built, and it needs to be complete by spring. The only problem, they just don't have the manpower. Seriously, the elves and men don't have a great relationship at this point, so asking them to help out is out of the question. Luckily, Elrond has an in with the nearby dwarves of Khazad-dûm, him having a long-time friendship with Prince Durin IV. Perhaps the elves and dwarves can work together to forge something that would benefit both peoples, something Celebrimbor said could potentially transform all of Middle-earth. I also want to take a moment to talk about Feynor's hammer. Feynor was Celebrimbor's grandfather and king of the Noldor. One of his greatest achievements was creating the Silmarils, and this was done with this hammer. These were three gems of immense beauty within which burned the light of Valinor from the two trees of which we saw in episode one. It appears Celebrimbor wants to do something that will have people remember him just like his grandfather. So Elrond and Celebrimbor set forth to the dwarven strong 
stronghold of Khazad-dûm, which will see the Fellowship venture through thousands of years in the future. But Elrond isn't greeted with a ceremonious blasting of ram's horns as he thought. In fact, he's turned away. In order to be granted an audience with the prince, he invokes the ancient rite of Segen Tarog, a test of endurance in which two competitors smash rocks until one can no more. This ploy actually gets him inside where he asks Celebrimbor to give him a few days to sort things out. Inside, we see a markedly different Khazad-dûm than we do in the Fellowship. The place is just teeming with life, with large waterfalls and the manipulation of the sun through mirrors which allows for them to grow their own crops. Prince Durin is not at all pleased to see his supposed friend. In fact, if Elrond loses this competition, he will be banned from their land for good. However, if he wins, Elrond will be granted a single boon, which is just a fancy word for a favor or request. Meanwhile, Nori tries to communicate with a stranger whose scream can apparently blast wind. He has no recollection of who he is or how to eat escargot for that matter. The stranger's arrival also coincides with Nori's father breaking his foot, something that will hinder his ability when the group is to migrate. So if the Harfoots find out Nori and Poppy have been harboring this guy, they'll surely be blamed for anything ill that befalls them. We also see that the stranger has written on the rocks and bark what could potentially be con constellations. He came from the sky, Galadriel saw a constellation from the sea, and Sadek remarked that the sky looked strange as he looked upwards. Galadriel finds herself saved by a group of humans whose ship was destroyed by a sea creature they call the Worm. At first she hides her long ears, knowing how elves are perceived among men. But when she's discovered, she's saved by the bell and the ship is attacked. Galadriel and a man by the name of Halbrand, a character created just for the show, are the only two survivors. Back at khazad Elrond concedes to the prince. He will be banished, but asks for one thing in return, that the prince escort him to the exit. It's here we find out why the prince has such resentment for him. Twenty years have passed, and not once did Elrond come to visit. He didn't come to his wedding or come see him when his children were born. Elrond really doesn't have an excuse here, other than the fact he's an elf and perceives time differently. Twenty years for an elf is but the blink of an eye. Still, he apologizes with the whole hope that Durin will let him apologize to his wife in person, something Durin agrees to. Here we meet Princess Disa. Unlike Durin, she is a character created for the show and ends up being the very reason Elrond just might pull off his plan in getting help from the dwarves. She plays a pivotal role in getting Durin and Elrond to reconcile. There's also mention of a seed Elrond gave Prince Durin, a seed from the great tree in Linden. It has now grown big and strong. I just hope it doesn't start dropping those black goo leaves we saw in episode 1. Halbrand is hiding something in his pouch here, something he does not disclose to Galadriel. We aren't exactly sure what this symbol represents, but Galadriel guesses it's the mark of his king. He tells her he was chased from his homeland by orcs, and that it's nothing but ash now. Interestingly enough, he says he's from the Southlands, the same place Erendir and Bronwyn found the destroyed town of Horden. Does Halbrand have a connection to this town? And it definitely seems like he's hiding a lot more from Galadriel. At the tavern, Bronwyn tries to warn the town of what happened in Horden, but no one will believe this crazy elf lover. If she's going to convince them to pack things up and move, she'll need proof. And this proof just so happens to be lying underneath the floorboards of her house. A day ago, Theo mentioned that mice underneath the floorboards have been driving him mad, which is all a setup to him thrashing the floor when he hears a noise. I bet his mom is going to love coming home to that. There is, however, something far more dangerous than a mouse beneath the floorboards, something that hasn't been seen in years, an orc. These orcs seem to be using an expansive tunneling system, one which Arandir discovers underneath Horden. He also finds these claw marks along the side of the tunnel, with something that resembles a bladed figure. I'm still a bit perplexed on what exactly this is, but if you think you know, let me know in the comments. Erendir finds himself chased in the tunnels below and eventually captured, but don't count his character off for dead. Remember that no bodies were found in Horden, so if it's assumed Erendir was captured by orcs, he will likely be taken as a slave, which is what likely happened to the people of Horden. When Bronwyn arrives home after unsuccessfully convincing the townspeople that the orcs are back, guess who manages to stumble into her home but an actual orc? And I gotta say, mad props to Theo and Bronwyn here who instead of pissing themselves in fear, do some great teamwork to fight and kill him. 
Now Bronwyn finally has her proof to convince the town. As if things couldn't get worse for Halbrand and Galadriel, the two are sucked into a massive storm, where Galadriel is wrapped up in rope and flung overboard. Now Halbrand could have let her sink, but he risks his own life and goes after her, using Galadriel's own blade to cut her free. I've already started to see some theories online that Halbrand is Sauron, but I'm not convinced. If anything, he may become one of the Nazgûl, a man so corrupted by a ring of power he turns into a wraith and one of Sauron's most ruthless servants. Still, it's a bit early for any of that. Nori and Poppy watch as the stranger communicates with the Fireflies. It seems as though he's trying to use them to point out a constellation. Nori says she's never seen those stars before, but she has a good idea where to find them. Maybe one of Sadduk's books can offer insight. We get our first look at King Durin III, the prince's father, and it seems the two are scheming. The prince assures the king that Elrond doesn't know, but we aren't sure exactly what they're talking about, even though Though the prince trusts Elrond, the king reminds him that there's no trust between hammer and rock. One day, one must break. So even though it looks like the dwarves and elves may be working together in the future, something fishy is definitely going on. In front of them is some sort of chest. We never get to see what's inside it, but the fact that it's laid out on this jeweler's table, we know that dwarves love riches, and it glows, my best guess is this is some sort of jewel or treasure, something that may have even once belonged to the elves. In one of the more intriguing scenes of the episode, Theo's blood mysteriously coalesces with the black blade and it magically reforges itself. There are currently two theories on what this thing could be. The first and not that exciting at all is that it's simply made for the show. The second, and much cooler, is that it's the legendary blade Gurthang, a blade originally forged from a meteorite. Funny, we saw something that resembled the meteorite fall to Earth in Episode 1, but no telling if these two are in any way related. The blade's last owner was Turin Turambar, one of the First Age's biggest hero, and this blade was said to have a will of its own. It broke when Turin fell upon the blade after he found out his sister wife had killed herself. The shards of the blade were buried with Turin beneath the Stone of the Hapless, which is now the island of Tol Morwen. So if this blade is Gurthang, it would have had to have somehow made its way all the way from this island to where Theo is. In the Get to Know the Southlands featurette, there's a great shot of the map which indicates the Southlands is located right where Mordor is. So it's totally possible that what we're watching right now is the beginning of Sauron's takeover of this land. Whatever this blade is, I don't think it bodes well for Theo. It seems like it has somehow bonded with him. It could even be leading the orcs to him, but anything with the mark of Sauron on it can't be good. The final scene shows Galadriel and Halbrand rescued by a large ship. Now I've seen the coming ahead this season trailer, so if you don't want to be spoiled on where I think these two are headed, turn away now. I'd place my money that this is a Numenorean ship. They are headed to Numenor. Now we'll later see Halbrand jailed here, but it's uncertain if this is for something he did in the past or something he'll do when they get there. A famous Numenorean you might know is Aragorn who descended from the Dúnedain, the word used to describe descendants of Numenoreans who came to the mainland of Middle-earth. So that's where we're left at the end of episode 2. What are your thoughts and theories on the Rings of Power? I want to hear them in the comments below. Thanks for watching everyone, please make sure to like and subscribe, and for more bad takes you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at ThinkStoryYT. Until next time remember... Awesome!